Everyone, thank you so much for coming to tonight's panel. Um, we are presented with two amazing speakers, um, Mr. Lin and, uh, sorry, Dr. Lin and Mr. Ga, um, both of which have accomplished careers in finance, academia, investing, and they are also parents of current Brown University students. So just kicking things off today, could you please introduce yourselves and tell the viewers here a personal story as to how you've reached where you are today? Um, Dr. Lin, if you could start, that would be amazing. Well, thank you for having me here. Yeah, good evening. Yeah. Um, I studied economics at Brown. I finished my uh, PhD um, in 1990. In the first decade of my career, I pretty much worked as an economist, professor, IMF economist, central banker, and Deutsche Bank research economist. But that was not my passion. So as you can see from my bio, I changed jobs five times in less than 10 years. I only discovered my passion after I joined CICC, working on finance. I just love the energy of the financial markets the thrill, the fast pace, and the excitement of executing major you know, banking transactions. Now, I was lucky to be able to work uh, at CICC, a very unique, it's an investment bank in China. It's a very unique institution. It was the first joint venture investment bank in China between a leading Chinese financial institution and Morgan Stanley. The founder's vision at the time, it was founded in 1995 about five years after China's capital market was established, very young capital market. The founder's vision was to try to build a China's Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley to help China's capital market developments and economic developments. We were very lucky to have a partner like Morgan Stanley, which provide technology transfer and also we learn a lot from, you know, our international partners like Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, and to introduce you know, the best financing technology into Chinese capital market, the best practice and experience. As a result, CICC grew very quickly. The second year after it was founded, we already led a major transaction called China Mobile IPO in 1997. It was the largest in Hong Kong's history and probably largest Asia x Japan. 10 years later, in 2006, we were leading ICBC, the largest Chinese bank, probably the largest in the world, the IPO, $16.2 billion. At the time, that was the largest IPO in the world's capital market history. So we were, you know, CICC success, of course, aside from shareholders and partners support. It was riding on China's rise and riding on China's economic reform, especially SOE reforms. We were at the right time in the right place. Now, in terms of my personal career, for the first six years, I managed the capital market division in SCICC. Uh, during that period, I led the execution of almost all major Chinese equity and debt offerings. We had a huge market share. After that, I became COO of the firm running the day-to-day -day operations for a decade before I retired five years ago, and then I set up my own hedge fund. Set. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Ga, could you please introduce yourself too and talk a little bit about how you've gotten to where you are today? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I also went to Brown. Uh, I graduated in 1992 uh, in applied math and economics. I also met my wife uh, at Brown. So Brown is, uh, has been very important to my life because without, without Brown, I, I wouldn't have the, the family that I have today. Um, but um, from Brown, I was actually hired by Goldman Sachs uh, in New York. Uh, and then later on, I also moved to Hong Kong with, um, with Goldman Sachs, where I've stayed since then. Uh, in the mid nineties, um, after working a few years at Goldman, I actually, joined my father, um, working with him and his investment company. Uh, but soon after that, it was Asian financial crisis. Uh, and then my father fell sick uh, in 1998 and passed away um, within six months after that. But that, at that time, it was during the middle of uh, Asian financial crisis. 
So pretty tough time. Uh, I've had to uh, sell down a lot of assets just to repay debts and survive. Um, but after the dust settles, um, I was sitting with my brother and we decided to um, focus on real estate. At that time, uh, it was Asian financial crisis. So property prices have dropped a lot uh, in Asia. Uh, and in the 90s, my brother was already doing real estate in the US. So we figured it's a good time to, to do that in Asia as well. So when we started, we were doing deal by deal, smaller deals, we invest out of our own balance sheet. Uh, larger deals, we would bring in large institutional investors and we act as operating partners. And over the, after a few years, we gained reputation in the market uh, and our own balance sheet was not big enough to uh, accommodate all the opportunities. So we decided to set up a, an independent uh, private equity firm, a real estate private equity firm called uh, Gold Capital. That was in 2005. Um, and our first fund was uh, $200 million and mainly backed by institutions that we have worked with uh, during those previous prior years. So since then we have grown. Uh, we, when we started our first fund, we invested uh, only in greater China. Uh, so China and Hong Kong mainly. Uh, and since then we have diversified to uh, rest of Asia. And then after the global financial crisis, um, because Western property prices also dropped, um, uh, there was a lot of demand from Asian capital who want to invest in, uh, in the West. So we started bringing Western capital to, uh, sorry, Asian capital to invest in the West also. So now we have um, pretty much a global um, global presence. We have 12 offices around the world, uh, 400 people uh, directly employed by us and over 2000 people uh, in projects which we, um, we um, uh, control. Uh, overall uh, asset under management about uh, 35 billion US dollars uh, and across the entire spectrum of real estate uh, from residential to hotels to office, retail, uh, industrials, uh, like logistics, uh, data centers, pretty much the whole spectrum of uh, real estate. Uh, we also started a uh, private equity, a general private equity investment uh, fund also, which we now have, have about 800 million uh, in portfolio. So it's, it's a small part of our business, but it's also a growing part of our business. Um, other than that, it's, uh, the rest are all in real estate. So that's... Uh, that's my story. Wow. Needless to say, these are both very impressive stories and very inspirational. So um, the first question is, um, in a post-COVID world where China is reopening to really everywhere in the, in the world, um, what trends are you seeing in China's investment landscape that are different from previous years? Either one of you can Kenneth? Speak. Kenneth, you want to, since you are on the frontier, you want to take up a question? I'll you know, add a few points later. Okay. Um, well, actually, you're the front line since you're in Beijing. <laughs> but um, yeah. I think um, in terms of a macro background, um, I started investing in China in 2005, right? At that time, that was just a few years after China gained access to WTO. Um, everyone wants to invest in China. Um, it, was, it was the largest... It was the uh, highest growth large economy in the world. It is an integral part of the global supply chain uh, as the biggest manufacturer in the world. Most Western institutions are uh, underinvested, underallocated to China at that point. Um, and the Chinese government have been mostly uh, quite predictably business friendly, I would say, economy being the uh, priority. Um, so it was pretty easy to raise money. I mean, everybody wanted to be in China. Um, now, today, um, China, of course, is still a large economy, still having uh, relatively high growth uh, compared to other large economies in the world, uh, with a rising uh, middle class, with rising consumption power. So there are a lot of, a lot of opportunities. But geopolitics has changed. Um, even before COVID, there was, you know, the whole U.S.-China rivalry. Um, so there's been starting of decoupling, deglobalization, where uh, a lot of big Western institutions would be pressured not to invest in China. So raising money to invest in China is different, uh, different today than um, the last 15 years. And um, I've been telling my team, that if, if we want to continue to be 
to have a sustainable growing business in China, we need to access Chinese capital. So what, that's, that's one of the directions we need to do. Um, yeah, so I would say I would say that's a that's the macro backdrop, uh, which is different today than um, maybe fifteen years ago and and the last few uh, last few cycles that I've seen in China. Okay, yeah. Well, Kenneth has given a, a bit of a you know flavor of China's miracle. It was a you know good period, but you know behind China's very rapid growth, you know for the past 40, 45 years, there was uh, also another problem. That's why you see major adjustment, you know, in the past few years. I would just add a few observations. One is the um, Chinese government has been, you know, as early as in 2007, you know, Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao already said that the Chinese, the, you know, the net breaking growth, the Chinese growth behind it, it was, there was a lot of structural problem. He used four, you know, sort of a UN and to describe it, you know, unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated, and unsustainable. Now, in the following 10 years, China continued to march on that growth path, focusing very much on fixed you know, investment driven. And as a result, it accumulated a lot of structural problems. So in the past five to eight years, the Chinese government has been trying to address those issues. One, deleveraging, right? Because, you know, the real estate debt, uh, which I'm sure Candice is much more of an expert than I am. You know, the Chinese real estate companies there was some estimate was as high as 75% of GDP, including, of course, pre-sales and, and, and uh, account payables, not just, you know, the, the debt outstanding debt in the markets. And, you know, in the total, in the US, the total corporate debt was 75%. So you can imagine the, the risk to the financial system. And then the local government finance, which relied on hugely on the real estate revenue, right? In some cases, 60, 70% of their revenue is from real estate. Now, with, with real estate, you know, deleveraging, you know, there's going to be there's a major problem with the local government finance. So you see the Chinese government has been trying very hard to deleverage. And that obviously have an impact on growth. So we see growth coming down from typically 9 to 10%, as high as 14%. Uh, the, the time, you know, Kenneth mentioned, yeah, down to about 6%. Even that, it's very difficult to sustain. So you, especially in the past three years, you know, within the pandemic. And then you see the geopolitical tension, uh, as Kenneth mentioned. So that's another major development, sort of a growth slowing down, and then geopolitical tension, trade barrier. You see migration of, you know, of supply chain. Part of that, of course, is uh, China's labor cost in rising. So some of the low end industries moving to other countries, you know, with a lower cost. Yeah. But more importantly, because of, you know, geopolitical tension, the, 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 the security of the supply chain, the, a lot of Chinese companies, foreign companies in pressure to move some supply chain away. So you see, you know, growth, I mean, net exports and, you know, so trade is another engine of Chinese economy. And you see that sort of changing in the past few years. Another major observation is uh, to address the, you know, sort of uh, unsustainable growth model. The Chinese government is trying to reorient the growth model. The so-called focusing on quality growth, focus on people's livelihood, right? Like investing in high-end, you know, sort of a technology, high-end manufacturing, all these, you know, measures. So China is at the crossroad in terms of its growth, but hopefully, you know it will move sort of forward and the growth can continue. But compared with five, 10 years ago, I would say the investment landscape has changed dramatically. I see. So touching back on the points about trade that you made, how does China's trade relationship with other countries impact investment opportunities? And how do you anticipate this evolving in the future? Um, well, I, I would look at the, the trade from macro point of view. You know, after China entered WTO, which was the year 2001, right? It was a rapid growth period. And it was, I would say nothing short of a miracle. The Chinese manufacturing, for example, accounting for only 5% of global manufacturing in year 2000. By year 2018, that was 18 years ago, it accounted for 
28%. Today, it's account for 30% of uh, global manufacturing. At the same time, if you look at G7 countries, in year 2000, it accounted for 62% of global manufacturing. 18 years later, it dropped to 37%. So the share was pretty much taken up by Chinese manufacturing. And that obviously creates some trade tension. Now, if you look at trade's contribution to Chinese growth, Chinese growth miracle, the technology transfer, the foreign direct investment, you cannot overstate the importance. Now, of course, in terms of GDP growth contribution, I will say the rapid period was between year 2000 and 2007. The net export, we know GDP is equivalent to consumption plus you know, investment plus net export, right? From our you know, standard macro textbook. Net export you know, grew from about balance in year 2000 to about 9% of GDP. So that was a major growth engine for China. Since then, I would say it has pretty much stabilized. You know, it dropped to about two to three percent. So I would say, in terms of contribution to growth, it has stabilized around two to three percent. So it's marginally it's not much, but it's very important in terms of technology transfer, in terms of uh, investment. Now you, you come back to the trade relation. I would say China has been very consistent in emphasizing trade opening up. And the next stage of development, they are talking about quality opening up. So during this period, China has signed a lot of you know, free trade agreement with uh, all the regions, like ASEAN, like the RCEP, right? Asian, whatever, whatever comprehensive economic partnership is the largest free trade block. So China is very keen on that. Now, having said that, I would say because of you know, all kinds of reasons, there's uh, increasing political tension and decoupling, they have a huge impact on market sentiment. And look, from now on, depends on how it evolves. It may have a major impact on world economic stru structure. You know, if it's completely decoupled, I would say it's a very negative for world growth. It's a loss of situation. We will see how you know these big country, big powers can manage that tension. But I'm hopeful that because you know, I'm a free, I'm a firm believer of free trade and, and, and market economy. So I believe, you know, cool heads will prevail and trade is mutually beneficial for all countries. So hopefully we can find some solution to this trade tension. Yeah, I think I would add that um, it's clear that for in the last 20 years or even 30 years, China is the major beneficiary from global free trade. So yes. there's no reason that China don't want to, to trade, right? China, China wants to continue to trade freely with everybody because it is it has been the biggest beneficiary out of that. That's right. Uh, but the the geopolitical realities may dictate that they cannot trade as freely as before. So that's, that's right. why I think we would be we uh, will be seeing um, new trade blocks, new trade patterns being formed, uh, which are different uh, from the last twenty years. Uh, and that's just the realities. And, and that's why you're seeing a lot more um, of these trade relationships between China, Middle East, China, and Africa um, being established. Uh, because China need to um, bring in enough materials, enough um, raw materials and uh, oil, you know, for the energy needs, um, materials for the manufacturing needs. Uh, food for their uh, own population needs, all that they need to secure. Um, so you would see that um, the trade patterns would be a little bit different. And in terms of export, um, it would still be an important part of the economy, but probably less important. Uh, you would see, I think, China probably turning more inwards in terms of relying more on domestic consumption to drive the growth rather than uh, export to drive the growth. So export will be sustained, but not be the main engine driver anymore. Um, so I think you know these are these are changing directions, uh, and it's still evolving, and it, it and it also depends on what the West, uh, the Western uh, camp does also, and how China will react to that. Thank you for that.
I, I agree with I agree with uh, Kenneth's point. Uh, I just add, want to add uh, one more, you know, one more thing is that, uh, you know, China's economy size is different than it used to be. So, you know, despite all these tensions, uh, the Chinese huge Chinese consumer market is a great potential. No company, no multinational can ignore this market. And the Chinese trying very hard to, you know, promote, you know, trade as uh, we, we, we discussed earlier. Right. And if you look at the foreign direct investment last year, China attracted 160 some billion US dollars, by far the largest in the world. So it's a still a very attractive market, I would say. So I'm still hopeful. One major concern, uh, one area of concern is technology. We'll see how that, that, that's going. But even then, I think China is gradually moving up, you know, sort of a technology ladder. And it's working with the different countries, not just you know the West, but also the global South. So the world will be a very different place. I'm hopeful it will be getting better and better, despite the short-term sort of you know tension. I see. Hopefully it does. Thus, given China's increasing needs, as you mentioned, both of you, um, what are some key industries or sectors that you believe will offer the best investment opportunities in China within the next few years? Kenneth, you are a major investor. Maybe you can give your take. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, the way I see it is, uh, China, is a, China is a centrally planned uh, economy. So I think you will do well following what the government is favoring. Uh, and if you look at it from that macro point of view, um, you mentioned also previously about uh, domestic consumption, right? I, th I think the next engine of growth will be domestic consumption. So you should be... A good place to invest would be anywhere, anything which is related to that. So it could be e-commerce, it could be retail, general retail, uh, it could be domestic uh, uh, travel, domestic tourism. These would be good areas. Uh, and then another area which obviously government is putting a lot of emphasis on is uh, hard technology. So these are things like uh, artificial intelligence, uh, electric vehicle, um, green um, green energy. Uh, clean tech, climate tech, that kind of stuff. Uh, life science, uh, also another area that government is emphasizing. So these are areas where uh, the government will direct a lot of resources, uh, subsidies, tax breaks, all that um, to, to promote. So be, these are good places to invest. And for myself in real estate, that's pretty much what I look at also. So the last few years, despite all the difficulties, areas that we invested in, uh, would be related to domestic consumption, like logistics warehouse, which supports uh, general retail, it supports uh, e-commerce. Uh, we also invested in a uh, niche retail strategy uh, like um, outlet malls. So these are luxury outlet malls, uh, which is a com combination of domestic tourism and also domestic consumption. Uh, we also invested in data centers, which supports uh, technology development, supports e-commerce. Uh, we also invested in uh, life science campuses. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a lot of support into those industries. So I would say for, for a place like China, look to what the government is favoring, follow that, and you will do reasonably well. And, and avoid areas where, where the government don't want you to be investing in. That's right. Okay. Well, thank you, um, uh, Kenneth. I, I agree. You know, In the U.S., you know, in the financial investment, we say you never fight the Fed. Chinese government is much more powerful. So you, do, you don't fight the government. You, you work in a direction the government favors, right? Now, I have a few, uh, I will add a few observations. One is at the macro level. Now, China's growth has been slowing down. So the world has been trying to find the next China. I will say the next China is China. I agree with the McKinsey's assessment. The, the growth, you know, sort of potential is still there. You know, some of the, you know, very good elements like an orderly society, large, hardworking labor force, you know, very high saving to support a capital formation, and uh, you know, a complete and very efficient industrial production chain. All these factors are still there. Now, of course, the government is addressing the structural issues, right? So we have to reorient the, the, the direction of the investment. You know, sort of. And for instance, the government is promoting a new, new growth model, focusing on the so-called to circulation strategy, mainly domestic circulation, like Ken mentioned, 
consumption lag growth. In the past, it was investment lag growth. Now they want to focus on more, con more consumption because the Chinese old growth model was so focused on investment. I would say people's livelihood was somehow ignored. Consumption, for instance, has huge potential. You only account for, account for about 50, slightly over 50% of China's GDP. Now, if you look at the US, it's over 82%. So we have a long way to go, right? And also government is trying to promote sort of a, you know, quality growth by climbing a technology ladder. A lot of areas are the areas that the government support, like advanced technology, manufacturing, high-end manufacturing, biomedical, right? The other area I can also mention is uh, aside, along with the consumption, is service. China has a huge room to grow in terms of service. Now, Chinese service, the service sector account for only 50% of GDP. Now in the US, again, 80%, right? Like take medical service, for instance. I mean, it's underinvested, underserved. And another important area, unfortunately, for now, it's been killed by the government, is education, right? They, they you know, sort of make education a, a non-profitable sort of sector. But I will say, I believe in free market. It will come back. You know, there was a survey. The Chinese households was willing to spend 60, 70% of their disposable income on their children's education. And there was a booming sector up to two years ago. <laughs> Unfortunately, the sudden change of a Chinese government policy killed the industry, you know, and wiped out hundreds of billions of US dollars. But what exists is reasonable. So I believe, you know, this, the service still needed. It may come back. So all these are the areas we should be focusing on in our investment. And also the, another area is environment, environmental protection and green technology. Right, that's China is very focused on, and it's doing very well with the solar technology, the electric vehicle, you know, sort of a technology is leading the world. So these are the areas I would say most promising. These typically they are what the government is promoting, and that's where China's new growth model is pointing to. I see. So again, on the topic of government, um, last semester the investment group on campus we voted to. Um, sell our position in ten cents because members of the investment group were concerned about the political turbulence um, within China, um, notably what happened to Jack Ma and Alibaba. So, do you have any advice or wisdom that you can share with for us foreign foreigners or foreign investors who are, who see Chinese internal politics as a wall to investment? Well, uh, in terms of uh, foreign investors raising China, I would say it's real, right? Um, you mentioned that the, the example you mentioned is uh, the, the policy risk. The Chinese, you know, it's a very top-down system and the policy change could be very sudden, not transparent. And, and that could be a major, you know, sort of, of a challenge for any investors. And also the Chinese economy after 40 years market reform is still not a market economy. It's still sort of a, you know, sort of a ongoing. Right? But I would say, you know, if you listen to the new premier's uh, recent speech, he's very aware of the, the issue. The, you know, private sector's concern, foreign business concern. So he basically stated very clearly that they, they would encourage officials to talk to, you know, the industry to make sure the few new policy making will be more transparent more business friendly. So hopefully this will, you know, sort of uh, ch change for the better. But I will say that's one major area of risk. And then of course, uh, you know, because it's in the market economy, the rules may not be very clear, the law may not be complete, all these are challenges. And then political tension, as I say, if you invest in a certain technology area, you may be sanctioned, you know, and the market access may be cut off, right? And then politically, there's still lingering concern, you know, whether the Chinese government is supporting private sector or, you know, or, or foreign business. But again, the new premier said very clearly, you know, he's, he gave a very market friendly, you know, sort of a speech, say that they will try to improve, you know, sort of a business environment. And they want to, you know, sort of a 
promote the atmosphere that whole society will respect entrepreneurs rather than treating as some kind of uh, evils or deviants. So by and large, I think the Chinese regulatory environment will be moving all of necessity, you know, being pragmatic. They will be moving in the direction of a sort of a more market friendly. But I will, I will, I still don't want to mind you that, you know, there are significant potential risk if you don't navigate, you know, it well. I mean, investing in China. So you may need to, you know, find local partners who is very knowledgeable, or you may want to find local partners who can provide good, you know, research and policy advice, like my old bank, you know, CICC, which is a, a real China expert. Yeah, I think regulatory risk uh, is important for both domestic and foreign players. In fact, in a way, for domestic players, even more important because it's existential for them. As foreign players, at least you have other markets, right? Uh, if, if the regulation is not in your favor, you can, all, you, you can always focus on other markets. But for dom domestic players, this is it, right? It's existential. Um, and I mean, I've been, I've been looking at the last few years' regulations. Uh, there was crackdown on education. There was crackdown on tech. There was crackdown on real estate uh, to control the debts. There's crackdown on finance recently, more recently, actually. Um, and I've been thinking why they're doing that, right? Um, you know, for tech, you know, so-called tech, a lot of the tech that have been uh, cracked down have been in areas of like gaming, uh, short videos. Uh, this is what the government, if you read what editorials talk about, they, they call these games and um, short, short videos as mind heroin. Right, because these things are so addictive, uh, they feel that it is weakening the minds of the youth, uh, and they feel that so much money uh, and value has been driven to these sectors, but these sectors are not strategic to the development of the nation. These sectors are sucking up so much money that they are also sucking up the best of the the best and the brightest minds in China. So instead of instead they want the best and the brightest minds to be focused on hot tech, like AI, like yeah. EV, like clean tech, like green energy, like these kind of sectors, life science, right? Where they want yeah. to see growth, which will drive the strength of the nation. I think that's what they're trying to do. And, in, and including late, latest, we, also, we have also read about, they are uh, attacking exorbitant pay uh, uh, and extravagant lifestyle of bankers, right? That's like, right. Why, why are they doing that? But I, I think it's related to this. They, yeah. they want the best and the brightest minds not to go into sectors where they don't see as strategic, especially yeah. in today's environment where there is this rivalry with the rest, where they feel encircled. They feel that they need to be self-reliant on these kind of high technology areas. So I think as foreigners, I mean, you you can rigor, throw, your hand, throw your hands up and say, hey, this is authoritarian, this is not free. But you know what? From the thinking of the leadership in China, they are, they are going to think that they are doing the right thing for the, for the strength of the country, right? So as investors, we have to understand that. And if you're prepared to understand that, then you can still, still see, hey, this is still a market with a lot of opportunity. It's a vast market. Yeah. Uh, but there are certain directions that the government wants to take, and there's a reason behind it. It's not blindly, they're not blindly doing that. There's a good reason behind that. So if you accept that, you follow that, I think you can still uh, find this a profitable place. Thank I you. agree. Yeah. yeah. And what you said about mind heroin, it's definitely accurate. I do spend way too much time on TikTok. Um, <laughs> so do you have any advice for non-Asian students who are considering careers in the financial services in China? Um, well, first, I, I like to say, you know, finance is by far the most lucrative sector in China. You know, um, finance account for typically eight to ten percent of China's GDP. You know, in the U.S., only at the peak of uh, equity bubbles, they account for about nine percent. So in China, we are in the finance. We are making money like a peak of a bubbles every year. Now take 2001, for instance, 
the whole security industry, the revenue is about 500 billion. Net profit was 190 billion. That's a 40% net margin. It's like stealing, right? But compared with the whole financial sector, it's nothing. The listed commercial banks are known has over three trillion pre-tax profit, accounting for almost 40% of the entire listed company's profit. So the financial sector is a very profitable business. Now, I believe the Chinese equity market, capital market will play a more and more important role taking away banks' business. So if you're in the investment business, security business, I think the prospect look very good. The banking disintimidation will continue. And it's at the very early stages. Another way to look at the Chinese financial sector potential is asset allocation. I would say it's ridiculous. If you look at household allocation, there was a PBOC, you know, Central Bank's survey in um, 2019, I believe. Equity and mutual and you know funds, investment funds only account for 2% of China's household as an allocation. Property, I mean, real estate account for 60%. And then bank deposit and others account for almost 20%. So only a tiny portion is allocated to the equity market. So, but as interest rate coming down, real estate prices stagnate. Equity is the only show in town. So there's going to be a massive migration of assets to the equity market. So if that's the case, suppose assuming that Chinese still can continue to grow at a modest pace, I would say the Chinese equity market is going to have a long bull market, just like the US in the past 30 or 40 years. So I would say it's a very you know, good area to get in. Now, in terms of um, non-Asians, I would say, you know, there are different ways to get exposure. Right? You can work for, remember China has pretty much liberalized the financial sector you know, for foreign access. You have a whole, whole you know, sort of own uh, subsidiaries of foreign investment banks. You can work from Hong Kong, you know, set up a fund like Kenneth you know, or hedge fund. So there are different ways to access, but there are also potential risks. You, know, you need to navigate, obviously. So you may want to work with some, you know, the local partners, right? Or you can, you know, as non-Asians, you can join a uh, foreign investment bank, you know, sort of uh, first to get your, you know, sort of a uh, feel of the Chinese market. But overall, I would say, I would encourage, you know, sort of the audience, if you have a chance, you know, don't ignore the Chinese sort of, uh, you know, capital market opportunity. I would say, I may be biased here. It's the single most, I think, potentially lucrative opportunity I can see in the investment space. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think finance market for China is uh, very high growth uh, and a very, very uh, important, well, it, one, one of the most important sectors in the, in the country also. Um, but I think from what we discussed before, because of the geopolitical situation, uh, it's likely China will be turning more inwards. So I think if you want to be in the Chinese financial market as a non-Asian, uh, you better learn the language and learn the culture. Uh, so it will be probably more difficult for um, foreigners to play an influential uh, role uh, in this space going forward compared to the last uh, 20 years. Um, but, I think uh, it's still a good timing to go into China. Uh, COVID has started. Uh, COVID has uh, ended, so China is uh, reopened and resuming growth. Uh, and China is right now the only large economy which has room to cut the interest rate uh, and apply monetary easing when everywhere else in the world uh, is actually raising interest rate and tightening. Um, in the short term, uh, China is also clearly signaling. Uh, that they are uh, favoring uh, private sector and being business friendly again. Uh, the new premier, Li Chang, uh, is seen as business friendly and also has the, has the trust and the ears of the boss. Uh, remember, Li Chang is the one that brought Tesla to China. 
right? So, so he has very good experience in terms of bringing large uh, strategic uh, foreign investors uh, into the country. So if successful, this trend can uh, hopefully continue and we can go back to the predictable business-friendly regime again that we have been so used to and so been so uh, happy with investing the last 20 years. Um, so I think the timing is, uh, is good for a, a new pivot uh, and there are good opportunities there. Thank you for that. So before I turn this over to the audience to ask questions, we're taking a step back from finance and I'm asking you a very general question. Feel free to answer it how you see fit. But what are your biggest regrets? Kenneth, do you have any regrets? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have big regrets. They're always small regrets, right? They are always deals that 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 I missed. I wish I I did. Uh, if we talk about business deals, I would think I would say that probably the biggest miss I had was this company called GDS which is the largest data center company in China. Uh, when I met the founder, William, uh, about 10 years ago, I think he only had one data center in Shanghai. Uh, and now he has, I don't know, I don't know how many, but he's the biggest, he's the biggest player in China and one of the biggest in the world. Um, so I, I missed that opportunity to get in on a ground level. Uh, probably from a China point of view, that's probably the biggest miss for me. Uh, I would say from my personal career, um, I regret that when I was younger, and, and I, I think this applies to all of you students, right? When I was younger, I, I was always um, feeling insecure that I don't want people to know how much I don't know. So I was afraid to ask enough questions um, because I feel that if I ask questions, it will show that I don't know certain things, that I'm ignorant. But that's my biggest regret because Looking backwards, that's the most foolish thing you can do, because if you don't ask, you don't know, and you'll never learn. And I have definitely missed opportunities because of questions that I never asked. Uh, so I think for for student, that's just uh, something to uh, to share with, share with you. Well, in terms of um, my career regret, I would say I wish I had uh, retired earlier move into, you know, investment business. I remember when I joined CICC, you know, 2000, yeah, year 2000, it was really unconditional that I run the asset management business. Now, the little that I know, a few weeks later, my boss, the CEO, showed up in my office, and he told me, Shou Kang, I wish you had a twin brother. You know, our banking business, business is taking off. I need someone like you to, you know, deal with the capital market executions. And your twin brother can do asset management. So I didn't, you know, sort of say yes right away. But a couple of days later, I agree. And since then, I've been doing banking for my whole you know, career until I retired. And then I set up my own hedge fund. I just wish I had, you know, sort of get into investment business earlier. Now, you may ask why. I'll give you an example. We did, you know, a great transaction like ICBC, right? Year 2006, that's 15, you know, 17 years ago. Of course, we earned a hundred million dollars. You know, it was a great, you know, sort of banking fee, right? I remember it was extremely, because it was the largest IPO ever. It was extremely competitive, all the major international investment banks. And I remember Goldman lost up. Goldman was, I, I always think, that the best investment bank in the world, lost up. But he ended up investing at the ICBC for about 2.6, 2.9 billion dollars and making multiple times later, only like maybe eight, 10 billion dollars. Now we were happy that we're getting 100 million dollars by getting a deal, but we missed out a great investment opportunity. That's just one example, you know, between the difference of earning a commission, a fee, and earning the investment return or carry. So that's one. Regret. Money is not necessarily everything, but with investment, it's so much more exciting. And that's why I, you know, set up the hedge fund, a hedge fund immediately after I retired. But I wish I had it done earlier. We missed many opportunities, like what Kenneth just said. Well, thank you so much. I'll turn it over to the audience now. 
Um, we'll say George, may I have a question? George, you want to say it? Uh, thank you very much for all of the insight. This is a question um, I think more directed towards Mr. Gaw. Um, a trend that's been occurring in the US over the past few years is the consistent lowering of student housing cap rates. Um, I was wondering if the same has been occurring in China and Hong Kong, or if the same has been occurring for other similar counter cyclical uh, asset class opportunities. Um, in China, Hong Kong, there isn't really a category of student housing. Um, in the Asia context, if you call Australia part of Asia, um, that's that's a market which has a uh, pretty established student housing um, uh, sector. Uh, and yes, you have, you have been seeing a lowering of cap rate. I, I think um, another category which have seen significantly lower in cap rate has been multifamily, uh, especially in Japan. Um, so these are sectors which um, I think investors have seen Previously, these are sectors which are considered uh, outside of the um, mainstream in terms of uh, commercial real estate. So commercial real estate mainstream previously would be offices, uh, office and retail. Uh, uh, retail has been has taken a knock because of uh, e-commerce. Um, and people see that uh, uh, sectors like student housing, multifamily has been generating consistent uh, year after year cash flow. Uh, and because of that, people want to invest in that long-term and that has driven the lowering of cap rate. So I have a question about, um, so through this, like the whole like lecture, like whole this conversation, I heard a lot about like technology investments, like how like China should go in like to more like investing in new technologies. And as a person who's really interested in like technology and startups, I would like love to know why do you think like China, like innovation and like all the new like technology startups aren't like as like active as like Silicon Valley and stuff. And how do you think like it should improve to like be more active and China to have a more like balanced and sustained like growth? Um, well, I, I'll try to answer the question and maybe Kenneth can add uh, more. I will say uh, China has been trying very hard to encourage you know, technology investment. As I mentioned earlier, you know, the Chinese manufacturing is climbing the technology ladder, but by and large, China is still lagging way behind the high-end technology. So there's a huge you know, demand, especially with the geopolitical tension, the potential being cut off from the most advanced technology. So resources are being pouring in. So I think that will change, definitely change. One major regulatory change in the past few years was the starboard establishment. Again, I, I've heard report that the, the new premier, Li Qiang himself, pushed this initiative. The idea was to, you know, sort of a lower listing rules for the new technology ventures to list in China to access China's very liquid capital markets. So I, I think all these efforts will push, you know, will accelerate China's investment in the technology area. And you will be a very lucrative business as well. If you have a good idea, you have some real technology, I think it will be much easier than before to you know, sort of uh, access the capital market and get listed. They've lowered the barriers greatly. Yeah, and, and also remember you are comparing China to um, Silicon Valley or the US. I mean, clearly US, Silicon Valley is, is a global leader in this. Uh, but aside from that, uh, China clearly is number two in this area. And I think uh, no, no other country or economy comes close uh, to China or the US in terms of uh, investment in technology. So um, I'm, sure, I'm sure this is an area that will continue to grow in China, uh, both from private sector and public sector. Thank you. And combining with China, huge manufacturing capability, I will say, the potential to have a good you know, technology project is much larger in the Chinese space than in other markets. All right, uh, thank you. Um, I have heard uh, you this work in the conversation a lot. Right now, like, Cannot quite hear the question. Yeah, can you a little bit louder? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Okay. 
Uh, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I was saying uh, I hear like the geopolitical words a lot in the conversation. And right now, like in the uh, U.S. because of this, like they are transferring a lot of supply chains to the Southeast Asia. And also there's a saying that they're uh, moving the financial center from Hong Kong to Singapore as well. So like from both of your perspective, um, you know, how do you see like the futures investment in Southeast Asia comparing to China and for your own business? Do you plan to you know, um, invest more in Southeast Asia as well or like more in the main? Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll try. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, Asia obviously will be a you know sort of booming sort of a region in the next you know five ten years or maybe longer. So it's a good area. But I would say coming back to uh, two two questions. One is uh, Hong Kong as a financial center. Uh, I would say Hong Kong would be a uh, you know important financial center for China. Thinking about the financing sector, you know, I described earlier, I think Hong Kong will have great potential. Singapore cannot possibly replace that, you know, serving China as a, and the region and the world as a financial center. Yeah, Singapore will do well, no doubt about it, you know, with wealth asset management and things like that. But given that Hong Kong can serve, you know, and be integrated with, great, you know, with China, I think the potential is there. You know, you may have, you know, temporary sort of a downturn for now, but I think that they will recover, yeah. Now, in terms of a supply chain migration, yes, the Chinese labor costs been rising, and then there is a sort of, a, you know, because of security reasons, technology, you know, sort of a embargo, some is moving to, you know, Southeast Asia, and, and that's happening. But here again, I would say it's very difficult to replace China's sort of complete, efficient production chain. China has great infrastructure, very well educated, hardworking labor force, very skilled labor force, and that cannot change overnight, maybe even not five to 10 years. So I would say China will still play a dominant role, not to mention China's great potential as a consumer market. Remember I mentioned, as large as China's economy is, the consumption and service only account for a small percentage of the, you know, China's GDP. It has huge potential to growth. Any major companies in the world cannot strategically ignore this market. The other important factor is China's saving rate is still the highest in the world among major economies, 45%. And that can support, you know, sort of capital formation investment for a long, long time. So all these factors point to that China's role cannot easily be replaced. Yes, uh, I, I agree. I agree mostly with what Dr. Lin said. Um, obviously, the last few years, for Hong Kong, from Hong Kong's point of view, obviously, the last few years, because of the anti-government protests, because of geopolitics, uh, U.S. versus China, uh, there has been uh, some migration of the financial industry from Hong Kong to Singapore, um, mainly because Singapore is the clear alternative. To Hong Kong as the as the Asia Asian financial center, but Hong Kong, like Dr. Lin said, Hong Kong will remain the financial center for China, uh, and as long as Hong Kong remains the lowest tax jurisdiction of China, which it will, uh, yeah. at least until twenty forty seven, uh, and if Hong Kong remain as relatively the freest place in China um, for movement of capital of you know, of, of other things, other, other, other forms of freedom. Uh, the largest companies and the wealthiest people will still want to come to Hong Kong. So as long as China's economy does well, Hong Kong would continue to do well and continue to be a major financial center. I don't think that would change. Uh, in terms of um, moving of manufacturing from China, uh, yes, for sure, we've seen that. Uh, and even in, for my own investment, we have been investing, we have been doing a lot of developments for industrial real estate in Vietnam, for example, because Vietnam uh, has been a clear beneficiary of some of that movement uh, because it's right next door to China. Uh, Northern Vietnam, you can access by both road and uh, sea lanes directly from Southern China, uh, all within one day. So it's a very good um, secondary base for manufacturing. Um, but remember that that is only really for some parts of the export sector. Uh, but China has a very vast domestic economy. So 
plenty of manufacturing will meet, remain in China, even just only to serve the uh, domestic market. Uh, and, and like what Dr. Lin said, because of China's supply chains, infrastructure, uh, even the export sector is very hard to replace uh, in, the, in any form of scale anytime soon.